Уважаеми колеги, надявам се, че сте имали един хубав обяд и сега с удоволствие ще изслушате лекцията на Фабио Антоначи, посветена на терапевтичните грешки и новите гайдлайни за лечение на тригиминална невралгия. Както знаете, тригиминалната невралгия понякога, колкото и да изглежда банална, всъщност се диагностицира не чак толкова лесно и понякога се бърка с други видове главоболи. Така че, please, Fabio, it's your turn. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak uh, about uh, the trigeminal neuralgia. Why do we speak uh, and, uh, trigeminal neuralgia to a uh, neurological congress? Because uh, neurologic, uh, trigeminal neuralgia is a frequent uh, Uh, sort of uh, fascial pain and uh, it is somehow a bridge uh, between uh, neurologist uh, and the neurosurgeon and uh, we found uh, that the literature is uh, full uh, of mistakes uh, and uh, for the sake of, of uh, our patients uh, we should be able to to see the guidelines the, the pitfall in the uh, management uh, of uh, trigeminal neuralgia and uh, check again uh, which are the latest uh, uh, guideline for trigeminal uh, neuralgia. Uh, we said that uh, trigeminal neuralgia uh, according to population uh, based the European studies has a lifetime prevalence uh, of uh, 0.1 to 0.3 percent uh, of the population. Can you see properly my slides? Uh, Fabio, yeah. uh, I, I'm sorry, but uh, maybe you, you have to, to share your presentation. Yeah. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, very good. Perfect. And uh, so, as I said, the, according to European-based uh, population studies, uh, uh, the lifetime prevalence is between uh, 0,1 to 0,3%. And uh, with the, the real incidence uh, of person year from 12.6 to uh, 27 per uh, 100,000 people. We know that uh, uh, women uh, are most uh, uh, affected by uh, trigeminal neuralgia and usually the age of onset uh, is around 50-55 uh, years. This means uh, still uh, in the full uh, productivity age. And as, as all uh, we know, um, uh, according to the uh, epidemiological Uh, studies, uh, we have to see what is the situation uh, in Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, as you know, the, in 1981, all of you know that well, that was when Professor Milan, Milanov uh, graduated, uh, there was a number of uh, patients with the trigeminal neuralgia, uh, somehow more than 2,000 uh, uh, people around walking in the street. Uh, but you know that uh, Bulgarian people is reducing the number of uh, uh, people who are walking around and now the, at the present time it is less than 2,000 people having trigeminal neuralgia. And we know that before the 2030 that uh, is, it's supposed to be uh, a retirement age for Professor Milanov, we should know uh, and be able to recognize and diagnose the diagnosis uh, and the treatment uh, of trigeminal neuralgia in the very best way. Uh, according to the new classification, I would like to uh, just uh, repeat something and focus on the changes uh, between the latest classification and the classification we had before. We all knew, know that uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia is characterized by a unilateral fascial pain uh, with a typical distribution in one or more divisions of the nerve with no uh, specific radiation beyond uh, and with some criteria. The pain has to have at least uh, three characteristics. Uh, it has to be short lasting up to two minutes. I always ask the patients, uh, Uh, have you ever had uh, 
a pain uh, like the one that when you put uh, two fingers in the electric uh, uh, device socket uh, and uh, and uh, that is what is really like is uh, um, a trigeminal neuralgia. Pain is uh, severe intensity, it is uh, very short, electric-like uh, and stubbing or sharp in that is uh, quality. And what is typical of the trigeminal neuralgia is the possibility to uh, have a trigger point, trigger a situation like uh, brushing the teeth, uh, uh, swallowing uh, uh, and, and so on, touching the, um, the, the chin and other possibilities that can induce uh, the pain, uh, shaving the shaving or some other things. So if we want to uh, focus uh, on the uh, clinical aspect of trigeminal neuralgia, we should uh, mention uh, the four uh, characteristic uh, uh, situation that we can face in our daily clinic. One is the classical trigeminal neuralgia, one is the secondary trigeminal neuralgia, one is the idiopathic, and then we have the painful trigeminal neuropathy. So if we start from the classical one, we may say that the diagnostic criteria uh, are consistent with what we have seen before, the clinical characteristic of pain, and uh, there is uh, a demonstration on uh, magnetic resonance imaging um, or during surgery, if this is necessary, uh, of the um, neurovascular compression. It is not a simple contact. Contact is something we should now be aware that contact is something and uh, the compression is something else. And uh, this uh, compression is connected with a morphological change in the trigeminal nerve root. Uh, this uh, clinical picture may be pure paroxysmal with sharp pain or we may have a, a pure paroxysmal with concomitant uh, continuous pain associated with the paroxysm. Then we have the secondary trigeminal neuralgia that is uh, um, attributed to some other condition like uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, space occupying lesion, for example, a tumor in the cerebellum pontan angle, arteriovenous malformation, or sometimes some other causes more rare, something like a school based uh, deformity, uh, general disease like connective tissue disease, arteriovenous malformation, neural. Uh, arteriovenous fistula and so on that can provide a clinical picture uh, quite similar to the um, idiopathic one. The clinical examination is very important uh, in uh, trigeminal neuralgia because in this case uh, you may uh, have the evidence of sensory changes uh, uh, in a significant proportion of uh, patients so you have to check properly the, the changes. Um, uh, in this situation, it's very important to carry out the magnetic reson resonance uh, or sometimes blink reflex uh, and evoke uh, potential in case that uh, uh, magnetic resonance is not available in some specific setting, not all the setting uh, they have uh, access to magnetic resonance. But then we have the idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia, and again, this one can be as a pure paroxysmal representation, or you may have also continuous pain in between. Uh, this uh, situation is confirmed by investigation, like uh, uh, electrophysiological test and magnetic resonance. Um, in this case, uh, the so-called contact, we have distinguished morphological change and contact. The contact uh, is very common, is, uh, is, uh, uh, between the vessel and the nerve, uh, is a common finding. But this common finding is also present in the healthy population. So it, this may be really a trigger, as we want to say, um, to recognize uh, uh, idiopathic uh, trigeminal neuralgia. I've seen uh, patients uh, with uh, a conflict uh, on the uh, non-symptomatic side and the uh, patients that have been operated on symptomatic side and uh, developed the trigeminal neuralgia on the other side. 
So the contact uh, is found in the trigeminal neuralgia, but there is no evidence of morphological changes. This is the main difference between the classic trigeminal neuralgia and the idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia. So the atrophy, the displacement in the nerve root are not present. And this is uh, unfortunately why uh, probably we have uh, too many patients uh, going to the surgical theater. Then we have uh, the last one that is the painful trigeminal neuropathy that can be due to an actual uh, herpes zoster infection or a, a post-herpetic neuralgia. You may have uh, a, a post-traumatic uh, um, painful uh, uh, neuralgia, neuropathy, so it has to be in the, a trauma in the clinical history, and you may also have a painful trigeminal neuropathy uh, connected to other diseases, or an idiopathic uh, trigeminal neuropathy where no disease, no findings can be uh, found. In this case, uh, uh, that, that there is the possibility that neuralgia is not only unilateral but can also be bilateral. Uh, in um, pain, it could be uh, at oral level. Uh, you may be, have affected one or more branches of the nerve. Uh, there may be different causes, uh, and uh, mm, there may be other symptoms uh, and signs of trigeminal involvement. In some cases, you may not have a, a positive magnetic resonance, but you may have a positive blink reflex. Uh, considering the situation from a clinical point of view, you may have other positive sign or negative sign. The positive one is uh, the hyperalgesia or the allogenia in the affected area, or the negative sign like hypoesthesia or hypoalgesia in the affected area. So this is the painful trigeminal neuropathy. Then we come to what uh, it has been our practice uh, in the last years, and uh, we decided to run uh, um, a, an international trial uh, with some colleagues from uh, um, Bulgaria, Greece, uh, and uh, Slovenia, and so on, to evaluate what was uh, the situation, and the possibility of mistakes and the clinical history of uh, our patients coming to our offices. So we uh, have done a, a clinical work on more than 100 people um, around Europe, and uh, we have uh, checked uh, we, uh, how many physicians they have been uh, uh, consulted before a correct diagnosis. And uh, we, we are not surprised to see that uh, there were more than two in most of the cases. 45 patients had two physicians and uh, 26 patients out of 100, they had they to consult uh, three physicians before having a correct diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia. If we see which are this uh, doctor that has been consulted, uh, uh, the first point uh, we see the primary care practitioner. He is the, the first one to have uh, trigeminal neuralgia. So the patient, as soon as he has pain, he goes to the general practitioner. After that, he goes or he is sent uh, to the dentist because the pain is uh, in this area around here. And then it may go to the neurologist. But as you may see down in the list, there may also be some other kind of, um, of uh, um, medical position that has been uh, consulted by the patients. And uh, uh, there is also a patient delay. A patient delay, uh, that is the time that it takes the patients to go uh, to, the, to the doctor, to look for the doctor. The time is not that long as it could be in other headache uh, syndromes. But as you may see here, uh, two, um, the, the highest number is between two and six months. And if we consider the mean, it takes sometimes up to 10 months. Uh, in most of, most of the cases, that you have up to 10 months before you go to the, to the doctor. And this is uh, a, really a time lost for, uh, for the health of the, the, the patient. But then we have not only the patient delay, but we have also the diagnostic delay that I would call a doctor delay. Doctor delay means that uh, before you make a correct diagnosis, it takes time. 
uh, it takes time. It may be in most of the cases in our uh, population two point two from two to six uh, months. And if you consider that the syndrome is daily, is daily pain, and uh, to stay months and months uh, with this pain is really a, a, a big problem for the patient. But what I'm, I was impressed. Uh, um, uh, af uh, after I looked the time to, to get the diagnosis, uh, that is approximately seven months to get a proper diagnosis, uh, is uh, the, the number of uh, misdiagnoses that you may have at the first consultation, that is uh, 42%. Again, at the second consultation, high number of misdiagnoses, 33%. And again, the third doctor makes 60% of my diagnosis. So the correct diagnosis the first time you see a patient uh, it's just 18% and gets more and more higher and higher at the second and third consultation. But in some cases, 40% of the cases, when a patient is sent to a doctor, there is no diagnosis so far. Then the instrumental investigation. We evaluated the patients that uh, have done investigation before the trigeminal neuralgia diagnosis. And this was the 73% uh, got a brain MRI. Uh, sometimes they got a brain CT scan that is useless. Uh, the skull X-rays and all the others that you see here listed are useless as, as well. So it's important to have a proper examination, a proper um, done to make a, a correct diagnosis. Otherwise, it's a waste of time, waste of money for the patient. Uh, the MRI investigation should be done according to our neuroradiologist with the T2, T2 uh, volumetric sequences. Uh, and the, the sequences that are recommended are space, Fiesta or cheese, according to the instrument you are using. You are using a General Electric or Philips or some other instrument. The diagnosis and treatment. Before the diagnosis, there was no treatment in 18% of the case. But what is uh, more, um, con uh, what I'm more concerned is about the use of some drugs before the diagnosis. Before you make the diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia, the um, doctor has been using non-steroidal analgesic drugs that are useless and opiates that are useless as well. And you see there are a lot of other things that have been used. After the proper diagnosis, uh, of course, the, the first treatment was carbamazepine and gabapentinoid in most of the cases. But sometimes they have been using, still they have been using uh, some doctors' uh, treatment that are not recommended in the guideline, as you may see here in the lower part of the slides. And they have been using some doctors, some uh, no pharmacological procedure that are really impressive. Mm, uh, it is not pharmacological, but probably it's more invasive, uh, if you see here, single or multiple tools extraction, 55%. Treatment are to recommend it like uh, acupuncture, local injection of steroids, anesthetic, and so on. Taker therapy. Taker therapy is even something that is very far away from the real treatment of the germinal neuralgia. So the, the diagnosis uh, is uh, it's very important. Wrong diagnosis imply a wrong treatment. According to the literature, 73% of patients uh, uh, um, in this uh, contribution underwent uh, uh, dental extraction. And this is a, a huge number. Again, in this other contribution from the literature, uh, you see that 80% 80, 80, 80 of the patients, uh, they got unnecessary dental treatment uh, extraction in, um, with the mean of two teeth. So they were not satisfied with one. And to be sure, they got two. Uh, uh, to extraction to, to see if that was the correct diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia or not. And uh, root canal uh, implants uh, and so then they went to the neurologist. But it is also true that uh, some other disease in the hands of the urologist can uh, have the same uh, mistreatment. You, um, we may see, for example, that 25% of patients who we class the headache are diagnosed as uh, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, even if there is a, a different, large difference considering the autonomic symptoms and signs that uh, 
belongs to, um, and the, the temporal pattern that belongs to cluster headache. Then if you are not lucky, but you have two possibility of having um, a problem, you get two problems. One is a trigeminal neuralgia, one is cluster headache. And there are patients that they got both of this. And you see they have different clinical picture, the one of cluster headache, the one of trigeminal neuralgia with trigger points uh, and different response to the treatment. The trigeminal neuralgia respond to carbamazepine and cluster headache, for example, respond to sumatriptan and verapamil. The diagnostic error in the cluster headache is very popular. Uh, the, here you see on the left side the time it took in the past, the 22 years in the, in the 60s, to make a correct diagnosis of, of a cluster headache. Now the time is getting lower and lower. But if you see what is still the problem according to this contribution, uh, you may see that in many cases, uh, um, or many of these patients uh, went to the dentist, the first line, 45% uh, and they got uh, an, an easy and, and uh, treatment, uh, and not careful treatment, uh, uh, like tooth extraction, splint, uh, x-rays, max surgery, and xylofacial surgery, and so on. So it's important to define the root for our patients with the trigeminal neuralgia. And it is, uh, again, the what we found in our um, in our um, in our paper published some years ago, when we want to check the uh, cluster headache uh, um, uh, error according to therapy and treatment, as you may see here in the lower part, uh, um, the, the, the first diagnosis made in patients having uh, uh, cluster headache. Uh, uh, was the in 35 uh, um, subject was a cluster headache, but in 31 was uh, still uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia. So there is uh, a gap and an overlap in the diagnostic criteria. If you consider the second diagnosis in patients with cluster headache, still we see that eight patients have got a diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia, while uh, the second doctor was much more prone to diagnose the uh, cluster headache. And again, if the third diagnosis uh, is done, uh, three more, uh, so this means the third doctor uh, was still doing a diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia in patients with uh, cluster headache. But then we come to the guidelines, to the recommendation. What is new in the trigeminal neuralgia? How we should behave with our patients uh, uh, according to diagnosis, according to the treatment, uh, and so on. And then we start uh, with the first section of the, of, uh, the guidelines, uh, that is the diagnosis. Uh, uh, and the first question is uh, regarding uh, patients with trigeminal neuralgia, uh, how can be corrected, identified, and uh, distinguished by uh, patients with secondary trigeminal neuralgia. This is a low evidence report and uh, um, there are no clinical points that can make you distinguish between, between the two. And in this case, uh, uh, magnetic resonance is a very it's a, an important part in the workup of our uh, patients. The second point was uh, uh, for the patients that having a, a facial pain, do we have uh, access to laboratory tests uh, in order to make a diagnosis of secondary trigeminal neuralgia? Which are the laboratory tests and so on? And uh, of course, uh, as we said before, if uh, some setting do not have a magnetic resonance, we or if magnetic resonance is contraindicated for that specific patient, uh, there is a, a stronger recommendation that you may use uh, uh, trigeminal reflexes, a uh, blink reflex, uh, and uh, sometimes a uh, book potential to distinguish between a primary and a secondary um, uh, trigeminal neuralgia. But what is, is a stronger recommendation is uh, uh, that you should not use a book potential to identify secondary trigeminal neuralgia. So some different uh, neuropathic condition imply the use uh, of blinker reflex and the bucket potential 
to make uh, a, a correct diagnosis between uh, primary and secondary trigeminal neuralgia. And then we come to the NDC, this famous ner nerve vascular conflict. This is the chronic for nerve vascular conflict. And uh, this is a very important in diagnosis. But as we said before, we have four types of trigeminal neuralgia. The neuro neurovascular contact, uh, any kind of, of contact, uh, is something that is very frequent uh, in the asymptomatic side, as I said before. This is the number reported by several uh, um, contributions by the European guidelines. So uh, you may have contact in the asymptomatic side. You may have uh, contact uh, uh, with the morphological changes uh, in the asymptomatic si size. So this means uh, that in the other way around, uh, uh, the idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia is uh, associated moderately with uh, um, a neurovascular contact with, uh, without uh, morphological changes. Uh, and on the other way around, the classical trigeminal neuralgia is highly associated with the contact uh, with changes in the symptomatic side. So this has a sort of... Uh, uh, a line in between the two, uh, the two situations because uh, the neurovascular uh, contact is important uh, for the diagnosis, but not only for the diagnosis, but also for the treatment. If we consider the idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia, um, this is uh, moderately associated with uh, the vascular contact with uh, uh, morphological change. The classical one is highly associated with the um, contact plus morphological changes. These are the two, the two points that are very important to distinguish and uh, from a diagnostic point of view, the two forms. Um, therefore, the demonstration of this contact that we do with the magnetic resonance should not be used to confirm the diagnosis. The diagnosis should be uh, first, uh, and then uh, you have uh, the the contact uh, as a second point uh, to be evaluated. But this uh, neurovascular contact may be of help to decide uh, where a patient, when and, and where a patient should be referred to, for example, the um, the, the surgical theater and have. Uh, um, a, an intervention on uh, the affected side. But, uh, and I should say that uh, this recommendation, idiopathic and classic uh, differences and ne neurovascular uh, conflict uh, is, a, uh, is a recommendation that uh, is uh, based on high quality evidence. So it should be taken into a careful consideration. Uh, but if you go on with diagnosis with the patients, uh, having patients with trigeminal neuralgia, <coughs> what kind of imaging we should do in order to demonstrate the neurovascular conflict or to rule out other causes? If we use the standard magnetic resonance, this may allow you to exclude a secondary form of trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, for example, multiple sclerosis, uh, tumor, and uh, but it is not uh, sufficient uh, to establish uh, if there is a, a vascular nerve conflict. So when you prescribe, you ask for a magnetic resonance, you have to specify the way you want to have the exam because your standard MRI is not sufficient. Uh, according to the guidelines, you can have a combination of three high-resolution sequences that are very important to, to evaluate the possibility of, of uh, neurovascular conflict. Well, uh, it, it is even better if you don't say to our, to your uh, neuroradiologist which is the size, so we may be sure that is uh, the correct size is taken by the neuroradiologist. And uh, in case uh, uh, there are causes of morphological changes, uh, this is a must. Uh, the, the, this uh, magnetic resonance with these specific sequences, like the one I mentioned before, is a must uh, 
to have a, a, a correct diagnosis. But according to the guideline, this is a low, there is low quality evidence, still low quality evidence of this. Then we come to the pharmacological treatment. This is based on the PICO evaluation, population intervention comparison, an outcome um, criteria. And uh, we should distinguish two conditions. One is uh, when we have a, a patient with the primary to Gemini neuralgia, which is the treatment of choice effective in the acute um, uh, situation of pain. There is a very low quality of the evidence, but what is recommended is uh, either the intravenous phosphonitoin uh, or lidocaine for um, the, this situation. This is what is usually done in uh, the first aid department. If we consider uh, uh, otherwise the treatment, the long-term treatment of primary trigeminal neuralgia, which are the, the proof and the, the certainty of treatment. Uh, and as all we know, uh, no, nothing more than we knew from the past, uh, carbamazepine or oxcarbamazepine are the must uh, to, to be used uh, in these patients. Here you see also the, the dosage of the drug. If there is inefficacy, and it may happen, or if there is a poor tolerability that may happen as well, then you have to select other drugs. Uh, lamotrigine, gabapentin, botulin, and you may use monotherapy or combined therapy um, in this uh, case. If you go to the surgical treatment, uh, uh, for patients having t neuralgia, how many drugs you have to test before? Medical management is recommended always before offering the trigeminal neuralgia surgical procedure. And this is for those, uh, for those uh, patients having a poor tolerability uh, to the drugs or where there is no sufficient control of pain, then you should send the, the patient to the surgical theater. Uh, but this is not recommended uh, as a first-line treatment uh, in our patients. And this is the problem that uh, sometimes we have uh, in Italy for surgeons that won't operate right away. The option are percutaneous procedure like a gun, gasserian lesion um, that uh, uh, unfortunately can cause some facial sensory loss. Gamma knife has, uh, takes a long time to have efficacy and so on. So first line is uh, the medical treatment. Second line in some condition, then you use the, um, the other percutaneous procedure. The treatment uh, uh, has to be uh, for patients uh, not sufficiently controlled by the medication. The patient should be informed that uh, even when they start uh, the pharmacological treatment, that there is a, a chance uh, in case of failure for surgical uh, procedure. And uh, but first line uh, treatment should be should not be the um, surgical approach in any case. Uh, there is uh, extensive clinical experience that uh, uh, microvascular decompression, so the classical surgical approach uh, is preferred over gamma nice, for example, in classical patients with germinal neuralgia, and uh, that uh, those that can be approached by uh, um, regular surgery. There is a low quality evidence uh, and a weak recommendation that uh, uh, microvascular decompression is considered preferential uh, over other some uh, uh, treatment over radiofrequency, balloon, internal neurolysis, uh, and glycerol uh, rhizolysis. Uh, still, is uh, there is uncertainty about the the which neuroablative treatment is the best uh, and what is best uh, between neuroablative and microvascular decompression. Uh, and this is uh, when uh, there is a significant nerve compression, like we have seen in the idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia. Um, uh, if there is no, no, no conflict, uh, or the conflict is without lesion, it's very important that the neuroablative treatments should be preferred before uh, classical uh, surgery. 
this is uh, the pain-free uh, time with a different uh, kind of approach and you may see that it's from 60 to 90 percent uh, with the surgery and it is uh, a little bit less uh, with our, the other neuroablative uh, uh, procedure that of course on the other side they have less uh, side effect uh, compared to microvascular uh, um, decompression. And as you may see here, these are the complications that you may have with the same kind of approach. And uh, you may see here in the upper part, uh, the mortality. Mortality is only detected in microvascular decompression. You may have uh, a fascia lipesthesia, uh, central nerve palsy, uh, meningitis, and so So the highest eye effect are with the regular surgical approach and less um, with the other with the gamma knife and the other procedure. What can you offer to the patients uh, with secondary trigeminal neuralgia um, before uh, they have uh, an approach to the surgeon or uh, the other more invasive uh, procedure? And, uh, in case of a secondary one, the secondary trigeminal neuralgia and the primary trigeminal neuralgia should have the same approach as far the uh, pharmacological treatment and the same surgical treatment. Um, for patients with primary trigeminal neuralgia, it's other um, possibility that we can use uh, non-pharmacological, non-surgical support that can be provided. Yes, we should have uh, patients uh, sent to the group. There are specific group for patients uh, uh, with trigeminal neuralgia that uh, um, at, at almost every nation and they have uh, support uh, from psychologists uh, and so on. And this is important uh, because the disease uh, uh, is really disabling. And now I would like to end up with, the, with my contribution showing a very well-known actress uh, of the, uh, in the Italian movie that probably is known also in Bulgaria, Maria Grazia Cucinotta um, was suffering from uh, trigeminal neuralgia and uh, she claimed that uh, a proper uh, physiotherapist uh, with a specific method was able to cure her uh, problem or pain. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.